All right, I think we have a good amount of people on. I'm Natasha Bonham and welcome to our session today. It's really great to see so many people on the line. I am really excited about the presenters that we have today. Uh, they really will be giving us a great overview of newborn screening and perspectives from the past, present and future from their different perspectives. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, as a reminder, which I'm sure most people, if not everyone on this call knows, it is Newborn Screening Awareness Month. And here at Baby's First Test, we are really thinking about what newborn screening is. And so you'll see a lot of that um, throughout the materials and promotions that we are doing throughout the month. Um, and one thing that we definitely know is that newborn screening is a connected system. For more information and to see both our toolkit on story sharing or storytelling, as well as our social media toolkit, you can go to babiesfirsttest.org slash 2021 NBS. That is also the hashtag that we will be using. So if you have any information that you're putting out about newborn screening over this the course of this month, please use that hashtag. That way it amplifies all of our voices. Next slide. Great. Um, so we are convening stakeholders to discuss how advocacy, state programs, and research have adapted or have really driven the evolution of newborn screening and the overall landscape. That is our goal for today. Um, and really thinking about, you know, looking at the past, but really talking about the present because there's so much happening in newborn screening right now. And then really with a focus on strategizing for the future. In just a couple of years, we will be celebrating the 60th anniversary of newborn screening, um, state-run newborn screening in this country. And so with that, we as a team have really been thinking about, you know, how has newborn screening changed? Um, where are things still the same? What things need to be um, evolved? And, um, you know, where are we going? Next slide. So um, with that, we'd love to hear just a little bit about you all. So there is a poll that should pop up for you. If you can just fill out these three questions, we would really appreciate it just to get a sense of who is on the line. Um, we know when we looked through the session um, and the registrants, um, we had over 200 people register, which is great. And um, just getting a sense of who's here and why you were here. So if you could just take a moment to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. Also, while you're filling that out, I want to let you know that this session is being recorded and will be available to everyone in just a couple of weeks. Um, so you have that to look forward to and you can either revisit this or send it to someone who you think will be interested. Great. So um, again, really excited to have you all here um, and to be able to hear from our really impressive uh, panelists today. We will start off with Heather Smith, who is an advocate and um, is from the organization Skid Angels for Life. And she will be discussing um, you know, what it was like to go through that process of having a condition that was not on the rest and not screened in states to a decade later was and was fully implemented. Then we will be speaking with Rachel Lee, who is a state lab manager in Texas and um, really has been at the forefront of you know, making screening a uh, reality um, and understands the day-to-day -day, um, functions and what it takes to actually get babies screened, not just screened, but detected and identified. And then we will close out the presentations with Erin Goldenberg um, from Case Western Reserve University, who will be talking about, um, I don't really want to call them emerging issues because they've been there um, a little while, but uh, let's call them evolving issues in newborn screening and what that um, looks like. And then we will follow that up with um, a, di a dynamic discussion with all of you. Next slide. So with that, we turn it over to Heather. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Heather Smith, and I'm president and co-founder of Skid Angels for Life Foundation, which my husband and I started 13 years ago in memory of my first child, Brandon, which I lost to Skid in 1993, and in honor of my second son, Taylor, who is currently 26 years old and living with the condition. I'm thrilled to start off Newborn Screening Awareness Month with this presentation. I want to thank Expecting Health and Baby's First Test for inviting me to speak with you today and allowing me to share 
an advocate's perspective on newborn screening. Without getting into the minutia around newborn screening, I plan to share my personal experience. Next. Sorry, just a minute. I'm having a little difficulty with my note section. <laughs> Sure, we can see if maybe Rachel's ready. I'm sorry, Rachel. That's yeah, okay. Rachel. I, I yeah. can go first. No worry. That okay. would be great. Thank you. Sure. As things change, we will now have Rachel talk about um, <laughs> newborn training from the state program perspective. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, such a pleasure to be here. And uh, thanks for uh, Expecting Health and uh, Babies First Test to organize this webinar to celebrate and kick off on the uh, Newborn Screening Awareness Month and, uh, and, and to include me to share a little bit about the past, present, and the future of newborn screening in, in from a state program perspective. As Natasha said earlier, and uh, I am uh, with Texas Department of State Health Services. I've been uh, with the newborn screening program for more than uh, 15, 16 years now. So I, uh, <laughs> I guess, and I manage and oversee the newborn screening laboratory uh, for uh, uh, more than seven years. And currently I am the technical consultant uh, for the program, as well as the uh, manager over the microbiological sciences branch for infectious disease testing. Uh, next slide, please. I have nothing to disclose. <laughs> if you see some pictures of some commercial products, in my presentation, there are loads of information, work decoration purpose only, uh, not any endorsement whatsoever. Next. All right. Let's start with talking about, let's start from the beginning, talking about uh, the technologies changes over the time. And of course, in Texas, we started with one disorder back in 1963 as a pilot study using bacterial inhibition assay, very manually. Then we go through 1970s and we did, we introduced radio immunoassay. Then we got auto, automatic punctures, electrophoresis, basically isoelectric focusing, those different technology. Then we got, then we add second tier rapid flow analysis for PKU and total cal. And uh, second tier molecular assay, we started in back in 1994 and using PCR-FLP for uh, sickle cell disease. Then we had full metric assays and full metric immunoassay for different kind of uh, uh, markers. Then comes in 2000s, we have third, uh, we added on to third tier standard sequencing again for sickle cell disease. Then it comes to tendon mass spec. And uh, that was the one that was uh, that enable us to do multiple metabolic disorders, looking at multiple analytes at the same time. After that, we got, I think next slide. Yeah, yes, and that's, that's a picture of tendon mass spec. And uh, we have second tier LC tendon mass spec, and uh, as well as some uh, then in 2012, we introduced, we, we screened uh, uh, SCIA, severe combined immunodeficiency, using uh, a molecular assay, real time PCR molecular assay as a primary care. And of course, in later in, in late, uh, I think it's 20, 2018, we started a pilot study using next generation sequencing panel and also looking at uh, uh, for uh, severe combined immunodeficiency genes associated with, the, uh, with the, the disorder. Of course, technology have been involved over the years and uh, uh, for newborn screening. And uh, so far the newborn screenings program have been successful in implementing them one by one. Next slide. With the technology and with the automation, and uh, we are, you know, we, uh, in the number of conditions increase over the years. And, and uh, we will start, look, let's look at in that back in 1963s, we started as one disorder, as I said, PKU. And that lasted, that one disorder lasted for over 10 years. Then we started adding 
uh, primary uh, hypothyroidism and gastrocemia. I think sickle cell disease, disease and uh, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. That brings us to about eight or nine, I think eight, uh, or in the hearing screen bring us to eight. And that lasted for about 30 years. Now it's not until in 2006, we added tendon mass spec along with the, uh, the ACMG work group and the paper on the uniform screening panel. And all these efforts together, we introduced introduce tendon mass spec and that tripled the number of disorders we, we screen from, uh, from eight to 27, more than triple. Now over the next few years, you know, we started adding one by one by tendon deficiency, cystic fibrosis, uh, scare, and, and the CCHD. Probably every two years we add another one. Then in 2015 we uh, start recording second secondary uh, conditions, many uh, detectable by tendon mass specs. That gives another sh uh, a big increase in 2015, and uh, then we add recently we add this uh, XLD and as well as uh, uh, SMA, that bring us a total of 57. So next slide. Personally, as I said, I've been with the newborn screening for more than, uh, for more than 15 years. I have, I have gone through seven different in, big implementation projects into add new conditions. And, and, uh, uh, and in every every two years, about that that we we implement one. Each pro project took about um, a minimum nine months, and sometimes even more. Depends on if we you know if there's a laboratory building retrofit involved. That's when you know you will need more um, uh, uh, longer time, and especially if you need to purchase bigger instruments. And and that purchasing process, if you ever work with state program, you know how, how it takes, how long it takes. So that that will cause delay as well. And uh, um, so I'm sure Heather was is going to <laughs> tell you a little bit more about it as well. Is the the steps that's needed to in order for us to implement a new testing. This here's an example of our most recent uh, addition. You know. Um, for spinal muscular atrophy, it was approved in uh, July uh, 2018 to be added to RASP. Then, you know, we uh, then we uh, then we our agency sent sent a, a letter to request funding for that. We got the funding in July 2020 and it was go live in uh, June 2021. It took uh, about 11 months. And the steps that needed to take uh, to implement is listed on the right side. And those are just a big, big chunk of steps. You know, of course, we need to worry about the billing. You know, good things about Texas is that if it, once it's added to the ROSP, the recommended uniform screening panel, and it's authorized. So it's funding a lot. So the first thing we need to do is ask for funding. And uh, then, of course, the methodology. Luckily for uh, spinal muscular atrophy, it's relatively simpler than, than the other condition because it, we just added to a, a, a so one, a multiplex with the existing screening method for a severe combined immunodeficiency. And uh, then, you know, laboratory logistics, you know, it, adding a condition is not just like you add a condition by itself. It has to work well with the rest of all the other testing parts, all the other, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the specimen logistics, the specimen uh, reporting, everything needs to work together as well as with our follow-up group. Therefore, the, you know, it's, I always say that it's like a, a new screen is like a train that's running and adding a new condition we, is that it's like we are adding a, a cart at the end of the, 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 the running train is going fast and but we cannot, we cannot slow down the, the train or we cannot, actually we cannot stop the train. So therefore that, that's how, how difficult it is it, because we are trying to add a condition while everything is still uh, uh, in production. And uh, uh, of course, we need to go through the follow-up protocol to make sure that the baby that screen positive will get a uh, proper uh, follow-up and care. And we need to change our laboratory information system in order for us to test the samples, staffing. We always need to add more and more staffing because we need more staff to do the testing and the follow-up and all the other responsibilities. 
And we, one thing we are focused a lot on is communication education recently, is to make sure that the provider knows this is coming and parents probably knows this is coming. And, uh, and, and we, that's why we have lots of uh, webinars and, 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 and lots of training opportunities for, for everyone as well. So, you know, it's the same process for all the addition uh, of uh, newborn screening panels. And, you know, I, I consider myself, I've been here, I've been through the seven times, I should know the drill, but, you know, I, I know what's going on, but every single condition is so different. That's, you know, uh, it's like, oh, wow. So it, it still takes that much time for us to do the whole process. And the good thing about this, this SMA is, is that it has strong advocacy. So they really help us to be able to get the funding as soon as we can and, and, and get the supports that we need. And, and also, you know, uh, as we've done this many times, the, the legislators or, or the resources, they have the understanding of how long it take. You know, like when we were doing a severe combined immune deficiency uh, uh, implementation, you know, they give us funding in May, in July, they ask, where is it? Why aren't you not at it yet? So we'll go like, it takes months. It doesn't just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. So therefore, you know, and, and I think with this, we have, we're getting better and better at adding this condition. And um, next slide. So in addition to the number of conditions in, in the test, testing technologies, uh, newborn screening have also uh, implemented many changes. And first is, we, as I said, we're building relationship. We are educating, we are educating, we're doing our best to educate, communicate, engage with the publics, with stakeholders, with everybody who, who cares to listen to us. And, uh, you know, we have provide lab tours and we, uh, we, uh, we have on-site trainings. We have educated, we send educated out to the provider sites to, to get them training so they can they can be uh, uh, they can know understand newborn screen process better and we have a website we have a list of notice and, and send out to all the stakeholders and, and uh, uh, we uh, we have webinars we have uh, also we we use, of course everybody using social media right now so social you know we, we are trying to use our network as well to spread the information as much as we can in addition. Nowadays, compared to 1963, we have a lot more resource and support, you know, and from federal, from states, from organizations, you know, Babies First Test, you know, and, and uh, you know, CDC, APHL News staff, uh, hers, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to miss someone if I start naming it. And uh, so, <laughs> but you know, we do have uh, legislators. So we have champion from our legislators, and, and uh, we we have great relationship with uh, uh, Marshall Dime, with uh, Texas Medical Associations, and we have lots of support from family as well. I have a list of family uh, parents that uh, I keep. You know, whenever I need someone, you know, I you know I'll, I'll contact them and say, hey, can you guys come and talk to our staff because. We want to hear from, from family as well to know what we do and make a difference. And, and changes are like workforce expertise, you know, it used to be just texting technology, texting people, you know, and, and, and technologists. Now we have, you know, we spend a lot more on nurses, on follow-up staff. We have validation implementation specialists. We have bioinformaticians, you know, we have epidemiologists, we have, uh, uh, and we have staff working on specimen logistics just to make sure sample goes through and, uh, and to, uh, to make uh, contact with, uh, with providers, we have educators. So we have a lot more workforce and expertise. And something that we work on, it was continuation operation, you know, and uh, that's something, uh, uh, and, we uh, we spend time and we have in Texas we have several agreements with different states and, and talking to them you know recently we had an ice storm I don't know if you heard Texas in February with ice storm and uh, we were not able to test numerous screening specimen for one week we had to uh, we had to activate our continuation continuity of operation plan as well career service timeliness and all the performance indicators those things has triggered us, you know, have been implemented as a result 
of what we are looking at to improve our uh, performance. And uh, it's, we're using evidence-based evidence performance measure. Um, we evaluate, regularly evaluate our cutoff, a positive predict value, false positive rates, you know, and, and, and the, we, we have better case definition. All these things are going on and, and, and keep improving our program. Um, of course, you know, we, uh, Texas was, uh, had a lawsuit uh, back in early 2000s. And, uh, that, and with that, and, and also at the same time, we were already working on some uh, laws and policies and procedures and to handle the storage and use our residual specimen and data that help us to work as you know continue our, our quality improvement process as well as allow us to be able to work with researchers in, in order to give them uh, uh, provide them the samples or data for them to be able to do the the, the research and in terms to help with newborn screening related activities as well. And uh, we expand our case management to support short-term as well as long-term follow-up. And the uh, um, number of nurses and uh, also some programs uh, may even start supporting like clinical inpatient uh, stays or uh, uh, supporting formulas and all those uh, treatments as, as well. Uh, lastly, changes informatics. We expand dramatically about uh, on our informatics. And uh, we're all working on our bioinformatics and uh, uh, working out interoperability and hoping to have better data integrations and uh, to able to for us to evaluate our, our process and, uh, and be able to have a better communication with, uh, with other database and systems. In the electronic reporting and ordering, that's something it's big. And of course, all that is uh, the uh, data security is also important as well. Next. What stayed the same? This is a huge public health success. And, and uh, I, it may not be uh, uh, when, I, when I was uh, uh, having my kids a few, <laughs> way a few years back. And uh, you know, I didn't know anything about newborn screening. I gave birth to, to, to two kids. We don't know what newborn screening is because nobody told us. It was best kept, best kept secrets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but now, but it's, we are hoping that it's, it's still, uh, it is it's still a public health success. The, one of the most successful pro programs in public health to prevent disease. And, uh, and it's a better, hopefully a better communicator and a better known. And the goal is still the same. You know, we still try to do universal screening and hoping to screen all babies in Texas, all screen positive, we still uh, receive prompt. We're hoping to receive, they, we follow up through them and uh, hoping to receive all the uh, prompt and appropriate confirmatory testing and once diagno diagnosed and uh, they can be maintained on appropriate medical therapy. And what stay the same is the variation between states. You know, we still have some, uh, we still do not only on the number of condition, the methodology we use, you know, the way we follow up and who follows up, what kind of uh, um, uh, other supports are provided in, and uh, they, they are still, there's a variability between states. And nothing stays the same, it's continuous change. We think continuous change is not the normal. We ne it's never the normal moment. We're still working on lots of projects at the same time. We, you know, we just several projects, we just implement SMA, but we still have four more projects we're working on. And that never changed. In the community in that dedication, here we are here. We are a community. And uh, on the left, I, I'm showing you what Amy Capito sh shared with me that, you know, uh, showing all the stakeholders that's involved with newborn screening. We're a big community. We're all dedicated to newborn screening. Next. Oh, this is just to show you that uh, there's some still variation between states, you know, not so much with the core condition, which is on the left top corner. And, uh, uh, you know, the, among different states, but there are a lot more uh, variation between the number of these uh, secondary disorders that screened. Uh, there are also some variation on the other disorders that screened in different states. Next. Let's just, let's, uh, let's take a peek at the future plan. And of course, I don't have a crystal, crystal ball. I cannot tell exactly what's gonna happen, but this is why I think. And uh, we will, uh, newborn screening will continue expansion and continue uh, quality improvement. 
we will have a great infrastructure that will help us doing this continuously. And uh, um, we have more sophisticated testing platform that can do multiplexing. That's, that's the best way for us to be able to implement several conditions at the same time, either using biochemical or genetic markers. Of course, you have to know that if we keep adding one instrument for each condition, we don't have the laboratory space. And uh, we only have limited space. Multiplexing is the only way to go. And it will be a more, more integrated, coordinated, and collaborative system. You know, they are hope, there are more opportunity for pilot study because now we have more resource and more support and uh, potential use a regional reference laboratory to implement new conditions or, uh, or to uh, uh, support uh, testing that is you know, maybe using more, more uh, complicated or sophisticated instruments in, in the, as a second tier. And uh, um, use of implementation experts. I'm seeing that you have group of experts going different states, helping with supporting all the in, in, implementation of each state, and the better interoperability and data integration, and uh, uh, to help with data information sharing of a you know uh, informative network, not just involving uh, the state program, the providers, you know, and then involving all the database within the state program, as well as pop, uh, parents and any uh, uh, um, disease specific database as well, as well as the federal database. Um, engagement with stakeholders and public, that's a biggie. We, and uh, in order us to be more harmonized and, and, and uh, to improve health equity, we need to have all these uh, we, we need to have the system to be more integrated and more engagement with everyone. Next. All right. Thank you guys for this. And, uh, um, you know, hopefully that we will be in, uh, ideally we will be a huge, big, happy family at the end of the day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, that was a great overview um, of the progress that Texas has made and how it's gone about it, um, and uh, and a lot to get a lot of great visuals to give us a sense of um, you know what we're talking about and that it isn't it's incremental, but sometimes there are just these bumps that come along um, with technology. So we now will go back to Heather and have her dive into her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for doing that on the fly. Um, I have it up on two computers now, just in case. <laughs> uh, it, it appears that my app must have frozen. But anyways, um, I'd like to start with when I became a mother for the first time in 1993, I had no idea what newborn screening was. It wasn't until I was lying on the operating room table after having an emergency C-section that my baby's pediatrician asked me if I wanted newborn screening performed on him. I didn't know what to say. After all, I had no idea what it was, but I do remember thinking, how much is this going to cost and will I have to pay for it or will it be covered by health insurance? What is newborn screening? Newborn screening is an important part of baby's care. It is a state run public health service that ensures all babies are screened for certain conditions that can cause serious health problems. Many babies born with these conditions do not show any signs at birth and appear healthy. In fact, many have no family history of the condition. Over 60 different conditions can be detected through newborn screening. For babies born with these serious but treatable conditions, newborn screening allows them to receive a diagnosis and treatment as early as possible. Newborn screening can change a baby's life by helping health professionals make a diagnosis early and begin treatment before serious problems develop. However, it wasn't until years later for me that I would learn just how important this screening is. Next. After, tragic, after tragically losing my first born in December of 1993 to SCID, I made it my life's mission to learn as much about the disease as I could. Fast forward to 2003 when the Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Newborns and Children, or ACHDNC, was chartered to perform evidence-based review and advise the Secretary of Health and Human Services regarding application of new screening tests, technologies, policies, 
guidelines, and standards for effectively reducing morbidity and mortality in newborns and children having or at risk for heritable disorders. Four years later, Dr. Rebecca Buckley, an expert in treating patients with SCID, was nominated by the Immune Deficiency Foundation, or IDF, and appointed to the ACHDNC. With Dr. Buckley in position, she worked tirelessly to convey to the advisory council that SCID was a pediatric emergency. So in 2008, when the SCID Angels for Life Foundation was first formed, one of our first tasks was to increase public awareness. Also in 2008, the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act was signed into law by President Bush. And later in that same year in November, I provided public testimony from myself and other SCID parents to the ACH DNC. Driven by requests from the SCID community, in 2009, the IDF created the SCID Initiative, which was a dedicated fund and project committed to supporting SCID-specific programs. I'm a founding member of this committee, and our first project was the creation of the SCID Newborn Screening Campaign. You see, at this time, SCID was not currently on the National Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, or RUS. So in the spring of 2010, when SCID was voted on and approved by the ACH DNC, and then approved by the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, history was made as SCID was the first new disease to be added to the Federal Uniform Core Screening Panel by the Evidence-Based Committee process. Little did I know our battle had just begun. The next eight years would prove to be quite a challenge. Although SCID had been added to the rust, that didn't mean a state was required to add the screening. Each state newborn screening program has their own set of parameters and guidelines for how they add a recommended program. Some of the more common challenges were some states required legislative approval first. Many states like Florida, the one I live in, have a state newborn screening advisory council set up and they vote to determine if they're ready and able to add a new condition. <clears throat> States vary regarding the fee they charge for newborn screening and who pays for it. So in some states, they need approval to increase the fee since they would now be adding on another test before implementing another condition. It sounded bizarre to me, but some states actually make money from the state from their newborns, make money for the state from their newborn screening program. But that may not be clearly evident. And at times it needed to be carefully pointed out before approval was granted. Because of the type of testing done for SCID, most states needed to purchase additional equipment first and some didn't have the space to do so. So logistically that had to be worked out. Adding another condition meant adding more full-time employees to help with the workload, for both testing and follow-up. And of course, before adding a new condition, you must make sure you have the educational materials highlighting what the condition is and available treatment options, including immunologists specialized in SCID to care for the patient adequately. And for those states that don't have a SCID expert, arrangements needed to be made for out-of-state treatment, and in some cases, what state-funded compensation looked like when traveling out-of-state for care. Some states had been preparing for this and had participated in pilot programs such as Wisconsin and Massachusetts, so they were much quicker to implement, while others seemed to drag their feet. Next. During the process, I found the importance of storytelling. While personally traveling across the country sharing my family's story with SCID, emphasizing that had newborn screening for SCID been available in 1990, Three, when Brandon was born, he would have screened positive, been confirmed to have SCID, and treated with a bone marrow transplant all before his first birthday. Instead, we lost him at age seven months. It's amazing when you put a face to a condition or a disease, how people will put down their pencil, stop crunching numbers, and really listen. People tend to forget that these are real human beings with real life conditions. They're not just numbers or statistics. In the case of SCID, this is a disease that's caused by a genetic defect. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. 
So we found affected families to become ambassadors for Skate Angels for Life and share their real life stories in each of the states where we were getting some resistance from. And that was extremely impactful. Next. From 2010 to 2018, Skid Angels helped organize rallies. From 2010 to 2018, Skid Angels helped organize rallies like the one pictured here in Louisiana that received tremendous news coverage. We spoke at symposiums, provided public comments at state newborn screening advisory council meetings, collaborated on educational materials about newborn screening and changed legislation by meeting with governors and other elected officials and getting bills passed to include skid newborn screening. I believe you truly, I believe you never truly accomplished anything alone. Skid Angels for Life and its partners worked tirelessly toward this goal for many years. And as of December 10th, 2018, all 53 newborn screening programs within the United States and associated territories I'm beyond thrilled to say our screening for SCID. Next. Since adding SCID to the RUSP in 2010, at least five more conditions have been included. So if there are any of you in the audience who may be considering or are currently advocating to have a condition added to the RUSP, I hope you'll consider the example I've just shared with you here today as a way to tackle it. There may be stumbling blocks along the way, but remember, when one door closes, another one opens. It's not necessary to reinvent the wheel, use the resources that are currently out there and collaborate as a community. And of course, remember the power of storytelling. I was asked to include in my presentation, what's next for SCID? I wasn't sure exactly how to answer that. So I reached out to the SCID Angels Facebook community and asked them for their thoughts on this. One of the responses I found most intriguing was from a skid mother in Virginia. She said, what's next for skid is to see how this new wave of skid children, having received both refined gene therapy and improved bone marrow transplant standards, fare as they become adults. So I'll leave you with that thought and end my presentation. Next. I've included my contact information here if anyone is interested in reaching out to me. I'm so appreciative of this opportunity to talk with you today about something that I'm very passionate about, SCADE and newborn screening. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Heather. I really appreciate you telling your story and also um, really getting the understanding from your perspective in terms of what it really takes to get a condition on a panel. And next we will go to Dr. Aaron Goldenberg. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. It's such an honor to be here with all of you. And again, uh, like the others, I will really like to thank Babies First Test and Expecting Health for having me. These are such important conversations, and I'm looking forward to seeing your questions and chatting with you more. Next slide. So uh, what I thought I might do is actually go back in time a little bit to 1982 where a article was published in the American Journal of Public Health, which really laid out for the first time the social and ethical ground foundational uh, principles that really are key to the success of newborn screening. Um, and I, it, as you all can imagine, it starts with the concept of child welfare, right? Benefiting the health of an individual newborn identified with a condition. And that's really why we're all here. That's what we really think about. Uh, as, we, as we develop programs, as we promote the success uh, of newborn screening generally. This paper also lays out what in philosophy we call the harm principle, which is really to say one of the reasons why we make these, these programs mandatory, one of the reasons why they're public health programs integrated into our public health systems is that they're so important for kids to get screened that that might even mean overriding parental autonomy in order to protect that child, right? Because the, the idea that a parent's right to make a decision may be over, outweighed by the potential harm of a missed positive result. And that really has been, again, that kind of ground level foundational principle for the mandatoriness of, of newborn screening. And then that relates to even, I would say, a larger principle, principle, which is this idea of universal access. 
that every child, no matter where they are, no matter where they're born, no matter their socioeconomic status, should have access to screening, uh, whether they're a home birth, whether they're you know, seen by a midwife, whether they have a doula, it doesn't matter. Universal access is really, again, that the third kind of grounding principle within newborn screening. You can go to the next slide. But we, we know that with that grounding, newborn screening has evolved. I really like, Natasha, your, your, your thinking about this, not as, evol not, as, not as totally new ethical issues or research issues, but really evolving issues. And in, in the area of research, we know newborn screening has evolved, it's changed. We know that the targets for newborn screening research and for, for practice have, have widened in terms of their range of risk and severity and phenotypic expression. We know that some of the conditions have later onset, either later in childhood or possibly even adult onset variants. We know that some of the things that we're screening for might reveal carrier status which may be important for individuals' reproductive choices or the potential for their children's reproductive choices. We know that the target and treatments are, look different than they did 60 years ago. We now have potentially more invasive treatments that we're researching, which include stem cell transplants, interthincal enzyme replacement therapy, and more expensive treatments like Spinraza for SMA or other gene therapies. And it's not to say that these uh, more invasive or more expensive treatments should not be pursued, they absolutely should be. But it does change the nature of our conversation. What does it mean to uh, get diagnosed with a condition that um, one may have trouble paying for? Or what does it mean to be diagnosed with a condition that the treatment may be very risky? Again, we wanna support these treatments, we wanna support the, 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 the expansion of newborn screening, but in a way that is thoughtful about these kind of changes. You can go to the next slide. And as we've talked about today, kind of the ultimate change, the big change that we've been talking about recently is the idea of adding genome sequencing, either whole genome or exome sequencing to newborn screening, right? So rather than looking at one or two conditions or 30 or 40 or even 50 conditions, looking at hundreds of conditions, looking at the whole genome of a, of a child. Um, and, and we've been talking about it in two different ways, either as an adjunct screen, so uh, a secondary screen, we get normal newborn screening and then do whole genome sequencing or as a replacement technology. So we're gonna to move towards genome, genomic sequencing uh, instead of traditional biochemical markers. I don't think we're, we're there or will we even be there anytime soon, but it is a conversation people are having. Um, what does that mean for families to get a potential deluge of complex genetic information that may include secondary findings, it may include increased uncertainty. Um, and and a, a big question for us is what does it mean to do genome sequencing in a public health setting, right? Genome sequencing so far has been mostly used in traditional clinical medicine. You see your doctor, you have an unknown condition or unknown uh, uh, reason for getting sequencing. This would be different. This would be actually integrating genome sequencing into public health, which raises maybe slightly different things around parental choice, around how information is given back. And it raises a number of kind of, I think, maybe not totally unique, but evolving ethical issues. We can go to the next slide. So here are a couple, and I'll try to go through these, through these fairly, fairly quickly. The first one, which is something that is not super new, it's something we've been talking about for a long time, is what are the potential psychosocial or psychological impact of genetic information? Could it increase anxiety among parents? Could it increase the potential psychological harms or potentially increase, uh, hurt fine family dynamics or create what some people have called patience and waiting? people who get genetic information, but their child doesn't have that condition yet, and they're concerned that at some point they may. This has been studied for a long time. It's not super new, but what we have found out in recent times is that parents do really, really well with this information. It can be really devastating, it can be hard, but in the past we've said, oh, maybe we shouldn't be giving genetic information to families, it might be too devastating. And what we found in studies that parents and families actually can handle this information fairly well and can integrate it into their lives in ways that are meaningful. The big question is, do they have enough education, enough, not themselves, but enough, enough in, access to education? Do they have enough um, access to clinicians that can help them to work through that information? Do they have the support that they need? And that's really, really key to reducing the potential psychosocial harm of genetic information. Do, they, do parents and families have the support that they, are, that they need when they get complex information. It also is a question about informed consent. What do we need to ask parents to get whole genome sequencing? 
What do parents actually need to make informed decisions? Do they need a 75 page informed consent form? Probably not. So we need to think really broadly about what kind of information do parents want and do they need do parents need to make decisions on whether or not they want to receive genomic information from a whole genome sequence. And then finally, this issue of return of research results. So a lot of what we're talking about is research in newborn screening, which is different than screening itself, where there may be results that could be either returned or not returned to families. A new Institute of Medicine report that just came out a few years ago said, yeah, we need to be careful about how we return results, but we need to think about a variety of things. For example, we need to determine when the conditions under which, which research results are returned and which are not, right? And that involves talking to families. It involves thinking about the potential impact of that information. We need to ensure transparency regarding research results in the consent process. If someone's consenting to a whole genome or to a research study, they should know whether or not they're gonna receive results back. And finally, and the most important thing is enable understanding, right? So making sure that, uh, that parents understand what the research results they're getting. I see a, a chat asking which IOM report. I will put the um, link in the, as soon as I'm done, I'll put the link in the chat or if someone else can find it, they can do that as well. Um, it's a wonderful report and it really does kind of go through strong recommendations on how one might return research results and how that conversation is evolving. Next slide. Oh, so this is my, my, my Star Trek reference, right? There's, the, the big issue is a lot of this, we don't have enough data. We need more data. We need more studies. We need more involvement of parents. We need more conversations about this. So we just don't have enough information to know exactly how to do all of these things. Next slide. So I, I wanna say something that I think is really important, which is that our societal views and our values have changed over the last 60 years, right? In research, for example, we know that there's a strong movement for families and individuals to know more about what happens to their data and samples. If any of you have read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, uh, it really does pinpoint a, a change in the way we think about research where we do wanna know where our samples are, how our samples are being used, who's using them and be felt, felt and be respected and make sure, making sure that our, that our, that our information is respected and that our privacy is, is um, that people are thoughtful about our privacy. We know there's been some controversies in a number of states, including Texas, as you heard, and Minnesota and Michigan about the use of samples and research. Um, and it just, for, for me, from an ethics and research perspective, it just means we need to be very open and we need to talk about these issues very um, collectively. Um, it doesn't mean it should go one way or another with our various conversations, but we need to have that dialogue. We can't really move forward if we don't have that dialogue. And then we also know that in the last few years, uh, advocacy organizations have become much more involved in research than they have before, advocating for families, working with families, working with researchers groups like Nord and the Every Life Foundation and, and lots of other foundations, I think it's been tremendously transformative to have voices of our families in conversations about research, in conversations about where, where research is going. That's not something that we had 60 years ago. And it's something that I think is incredibly valuable and incredibly meaningful for collaborative work in, in, in ethics and newborn screening and newborn screening research. Next slide. So I wanna come up with, I just wanna say, as I finish two big things that I think are coming on the horizon that we should be thinking about. Um, you can actually go to the next slide. Uh, the first one is uncertainty. We know that as newborn screening evolves and we add more conditions and we add genome sequencing, we may be able to take care of things like reducing false positive information that families are getting. But we also know that the more and more we include genomic sequencing, the more uncertainty we may get. And that is meaningful to families. We need to think about what it means to get uncertain uh, results. Does that increase anxiety? Does that comfort families? Does that give families more resources to go and talk to their doctors about what their children, what their newborns may have? We just don't know really yet. This is another area where we need more data on what the impact of uncertainty on families may be. And so this for me is like one of the big kind of future topics for newborn screening is how do we address increased uncertainty in newborn screening? Next slide. And, the, um, and I actually wanna just very quickly say, we can go back to the past. It's not that uncertainty is totally new. We've actually had uncertainty in newborn screening for a long time. 
We just need to listen to the past. We need to think about how, how we've dealt with things. This is an article from 1968 that talked about PKU anxiety syndrome. This was an idea that someone may get a false positive from a PKU screen in 1968, and that even though they got a false positive result, they may still be very nervous that their child may have something or that there may be something wrong with their child. And um, it, it was, it, it's important for us to recognize that while some of these things are new, they're not all that new. We've actually done really, really well. I think the New World Screening Community has done better than many other research communities in dealing with uncertainty. And I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from, the, from our history in, in, in terms of what we can know going forward. Next slide. And then I wanna just say something very quickly about equity and thinking about diversity in research and in newborn screening research particularly. We know that over time, there's been a persistent bias uh, um, in bi biomedical research in leaving out, for example, communities of color. So African-American fa families leaving out Hispanic, uh, Latino, Latina families. Um, we know that that's changed a little bit over time, but in in increasingly we're recognizing that there is a bias in our biomedical research and that underserved, underrepresented communities of color have not been adequately included in research. What that means is that the benefits of the research may not be seen by those communities either. Because if, if the research that is, is being done does not include families from different backgrounds, we, 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 it, it potentially biases the research, right? And that's problematic. We know that there are lots of other equity issues in newborn screening as well. We know that there are issues in terms of who has access to research participation, who actually gets asked to be in research. We know there are equity issues in terms of outreach and education and engagement. We know that there's potentially systematic discrimination or stigmatization based on research results that we have to think about. We also know that there may be a lack of benefit sharing and access to treatments once research is done. So as uncertainty is one of the issues that I think is really key for the future, the other one is issues of equity. And I think we have to be really thoughtful about how we can make sure that newborn screening remains an equitable system, not just the screening itself, we do a pretty good job in making sure everyone can get the screening, but everything after that heel prick, making sure that we really think truly about equity through the whole newborn screening system. And then one more slide and then I'll be, um, which is, I just wanna say something about the importance of engaging ethics, right? We need more empirical data, that's, that's really clear. We also need to highlight familial expertise. Sometimes in research, families' voices can get drowned out. And I think it's incredibly important that families become part of the research enterprise in a way that, that allows their own expertise, their familiar experiences and narratives to be part of the way in which we research newborn screening and the future of newborn screening. We also have to go deeper than consent issues. When we think about ethics, we tend to think about consent. Oh, it's about parental permission, and it is. But it's also about disparities. It's about the impact of information on families. It's about the ethics of inaction. What are the ethics of not doing something, about not adding a condition to a panel? And then thinking about resources. Especially in the last couple of years, as COVID, as we've been dealing with COVID, resource allocation has become a really strong and important issue. Um, and then, last thing, we need to do this together. And this is where I'll end. We need to engage in these questions together with state programs and families and work collectively. And I just think we have a real opportunity to take on these, I think, really hard issues together in ways that we haven't before. And that has really provided me personally, and I hope you all of you, with a lot of hope and a lot of excitement for, for moving newborn screening forward. I will end there. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing your questions. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, really appreciate your comments and the things that you were you know, explaining and always great visuals. Um, I think it's important to note that girl with the shirt, I think is 11 years old. <laughs> just to show how long we've been using that picture, but still very relevant. Um, that again, these are evolving issues, not um, new or emerging ones. Um, you know, one question or comment that I had, we have just a minute or two left is, you know, I really appreciated Rachel, the slide that you showed that really showed that as technology is implemented, we don't just have this very gradual buildup in terms of um, the number of conditions we screen for. It really are these bumps and these leaps um, that, that happen. And just trying to think, you know, and anyone can comment on this, do we see that same type of jump or leap that we see from technology when we are thinking about 
education or communication or all the other investments that we know really need to go into newborn screening like long-term follow-up. So just anyone who wants to chime in on that point that while technology leads to these jumps um, that were very nicely visually presented, are there other jumps that we may want to see to go along with that? Anyone want to answer? <laughs> well, this is Rachel. And, and, and well, I will say definitely, you know, of course we would love to have this jump in, in you know, in how think about all the other public health stories in, in, in the uh, programs. We have many education and, and outreach programs, you know, uh, you know, and that's, uh, it could be chronic disease, could be could could be a, a tobacco succession, or it could be even you know, uh, all, all, so many so many different examples that we were able to outreach to the public and family in, in increase awareness in a very strong way of campaigning and for for uh, for basically for their involvement and participation and any interest. So you know, I would love to see that. With newborn screening. Great. Um, since we are over time, I did see one question come through. We will get written responses from our presenters on that question and then send it out to everyone, um, just because uh, we want to make sure that people can get off to their next meetings. Um, but I wanted to say thank you so much to our panelists for joining and for having such great um, information to share and really planting a lot of seeds for further dialogue. We will definitely um, be sharing the recording, the answers to the questions um, in a couple of weeks back to everyone on, on this call. And with that, thank you so much. Keep celebrating newborn screening. We've come such a long way um, and we definitely have yeah, uh, more exciting things to come for the rest of the month. So thank you everyone and have a great afternoon.